Welcome to the Tucson Festival of Books Teen and Tween Audio Interviews here at the University of Arizona. Excellent. Okay, I'll start. Hi. I'm Sierra. I'm, I'm a student at Saguaro. Um, I didn't, not a part of any boards really or anything. Ms. Creed just came to me with the opportunity. I'm like, that sounds so sick. So I, she gave, <laughs> lent me the book online and started reading it. And it was really good. Yay. Uh, my name is Nigel. I'm with Ms. Mira at the Judy Mary's Teen Advisory Board. Um, I love your book too. Yay. I read it and I think one day I just went, wow. Oh. <laughs> I hope they have 10 years you read my book in one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Samuel. I'm also with Ms. Mira and Nigel at the Disney Bear River TAB. Um, your book was really interesting. I think that at some points I'm like, you know, this is kind of like that one Indiana Jones movie where like he goes to, um, I can't believe, I can't remember which one it was, but he goes to like this island and he finds some underground civilization. And I was like, okay, this is like, I can vibe with this movie. No. So. I feel it. <laughs> um, welcome to the Tucson Festival of Books audio interview of debut novelist Liz Huerta of The Lost Dreamer, hosted by the Pima County Public Library. We are the Duesenberry River Teen Advisory Board and students from Saguaro High School. So I guess I'll start with the questions. I was wondering what motivated you to focus on the relationship between female relatives specifically in this book and in a lot of your short stories as well? Those are the most important relationships in my life. I come from a lineage of incredibly strong women on both sides of my family. Um, I have one of my one of my male cousins always says, he's like, I only can date strong women because the women I was raised with. Every single woman in my family is a warrior in her own way. Um, and like the women in the book, we're really, really close. We fight, we bicker, we have chaos between us. But at the end of the day, there is a ton of love between us. And um, I also, I don't have any children, but I have a lot of nieces and nephews, not just through my sisters, but through uh, my cousins. So I wanted to kind of, the, the aunts, aunts are really sacred in my family. And I'm like, I'm a sacred auntie and I wanted to write sacred aunties. And I wanted to center the just powerful bonds between women and some toxic ones too, because there's a couple of toxic bonds in the book as well. But I just wanted to center that because that's my life and I wanted it to be on the page to honor the incredible women that I was born to and raised with. Okay, I'll go next. Um, I was wondering where you came up with the setting of the novel and that you do a lot of world building and what importance does it play in this no novel and possibly future novels? Um, so interestingly, like the characters in The Lost Dreamer, I go to the same place every night when I dream. I have my own dream world. I have had it since probably 25 years, and there's a cove that Saya visits in the book. It's her favorite place, and that's my favorite place when I go to my dream world. And in my, on the Mexican side of my family, um, We've always talked about dreams every day. Like the women are dreamers. My grandmother is a dreamer. My aunts are dreamers. We talk about our dreams all the time. My grandmother's known to have prophetic dreams. I've dreamed deaths before they've happened. It's just part of who I am. And the landscape, I wanted to honor my ancestral homeland. I loved fantasy growing up. I loved fantasy, but there was nothing that looked like where I was from. There was, those landscapes just didn't exist. And sometimes I'd read a fantasy book and somebody would be drinking chocolate. I'm like, where did you get that chocolate? Because cacao is from my part of the world. How come this world, it has to exist for you to be drinking chocolate, but where does that fantastical world exist? In my 20s, I went to art school in Mexico and I would travel around and I'd go to these amazing archeological sites and I would sit there and think, there are countless stories here that have gone untold. And I was like, I don't necessarily want to write historical fiction. Um, that's just not for me. I didn't want to use any living or transitioned cultures. So I said, I'm going to write a fantastical version of my homelands because they're beautiful and there's so much potential there. And I have a lot of fun doing it. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to go next. Uh, so the dream in your novel is the concept surrounded by nature and animals like jaguar 
Um, and so I wanted to ask, how does employing such aspects make your book like the perfect friend for those who are lonely? I think it's that perfect friend for those who are lonely. I was an incredibly lonely kid growing up. I was super lonely and I hung out at the library all the time. I hung out with the librarian. In fact, my childhood librarian came to my um, book release. She's in her 80s. And I was like, how did you get here? Like, who drove you? <laughs> You know, and she came in with her, and it was beautiful that this woman, when I was five years old, I told her, you're still the reason I don't take a buck into a bathtub. Um, so I was a really lonely child, and I would escape into this fantastical world. Um, and fantasy in particular allows such possibility of imagination. And I also wanted to write about the interconnectedness of the natural world, the living planet, with humans and these human-like um, characters that are kind of anthropomorphic, the elk that you're talking about. So I wanted to just create this world of possibility where Saya in particular is very lonely because of her abusive relationship with her mother. So she has these relationships with these spirits and entities and this other dimension that kind of fortify her. And I think in some ways I had this, I don't want to say I had imaginary friends, but I felt like I had relationships with fantasy in my life that sustained me. So um, another question for me. Um, I was wondering when you started writing this book, did you approach it with the intent of writing two storylines that were separated by time but like parallel and then connected? Or did that kind of evolve as you kept writing the book? It was not my intention at all. I originally wanted to sell a trilogy. Um, and when we took the book to market, the editor who eventually purchased it, um, I had written book one, which was all in your story. And she said, I love this, but I love your idea for book two. I want you to cut them both in half and weave them together and make it into one book. And she said, can you do that? And in my head, I thought, no way. But I said, yes, of course I can. And I honestly had no idea how to do it till I sat down and I did it. And I really, I kind of liked the playing with the timeline and playing with the stories. I think it creates a book that you're reading on multiple levels. And then when you, when you finish the book and then you go back and reread it, you can see what I did. You know, I leave hints and clues along the way to their relationship, but you don't really get that until you've read the book for the first time. It was really challenging. Um, there were times that I didn't, I didn't know how I was doing it. And I was rewriting it during um, the first part of the pandemic. And I just made charts. I decided what the timelines were going to be. And I just sat down and I did it. It was really challenging, but it, I'm really satisfied with the result. Yeah, that's my favorite part of the book. I know. <laughs> my sister called me in the middle of the, or in the, middle of the night. She said, what? what? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Um, I was wondering what personal connection you feel to the characters and like who in your life you drew inspiration for all these like complex characters. I think I relate to both India and Saya. Um, I was raised um, Jehovah's Witness, you know, in a very kind of isolated religion when I was growing up. And in adolescence, we left the religion. So I lost my religion. I lost my belief system, which is probably why I went off. Um, because I didn't know how to interact with the world. And so I had this very intimate awareness of what it feels like to lose your faith, to lose your identity in your belief system. So I gave that to India. And with Saya, I also have gone through the world a lot of times feeling like I have these abilities that make no sense. On my Mexican side of my family, we're probably detribalized two or three generations away from language, away from the culture, away from the heritage because of colonization and all sorts of things. So while I still feel a connection to my ancestors, I have no training. I don't have our stories. I don't have that lineage, but I still feel a very deep connection to that culture. So I wanted to have Saya have that experience where she has this beautiful gift and she knows there's something there, but she doesn't know where it, where it comes from. That's, that's pretty deep. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's also a strong emphasis in this book on storytelling and singing. Why did you 
focus on those modes of communication. We're all made of stories. It's what makes us human. You know, um, we are, as far as we know, the only creatures on this planet who have the ability to imagine, to create, and to story tell. And so we are made of our story. So I made that like a central part of the world. And for singing, I, I was raised with a family that sings all the time. My father's a musician. He would wake us up in the morning by playing guitar and singing. And we're just a family that sings. And so singing felt like a very natural part of the world. Um, I sing all the time. My poor neighbors, I have this karaoke mic. <laughs> and I'm always having solo concerts in my bathroom. And it's like, oh my gosh, she's singing Morrissey again. She's singing the Scorpions again, you know? like. Bauhaus, this girl. I'm like, yeah, sorry, I, I love the thing. So I was like, well, let's put singing in the book. And then singing as a way of healing as well. Um, because I think that's just a kind of a cool magic system. You're <laughs> so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I feel like a dork, though. That's the thing. I, think you, I feel I'm, I'm always going to be a dork in my heart. Like, but when you're surrounded by other dorks and that, yeah. like, they're written this awesome book, like it's queen. just... Yeah, yeah it's like queen of a dork. <laughs> um, I was wondering, I, I've never heard these names in the novel before. I was wondering how you chose them for your characters. This is so funny. People keep asking me this question. They're like, what do the names mean, Liz? And I'm like, <laughs> I like the way they sound in my mouth. <laughs> like, that's pretty much it. In fact, actually, the character Saya... When I was in high school, I um, had an instructor, a theater instructor, who had us write a play. And I wrote the name of the character, Saya. And I was like, ooh, I love that. And that was 25 years ago. And I saved that name. And I was like, I'm going to put that into a book one day. And I just liked the way the name spelled in my mouth. I'm neurodiverse, so I'm very tactile. Um, like in the time of my writing process, I have to have like incense going or candle, I have to have salty snacks, I have to be very comfortable. My um, sensory perception is very important to me. So I like the way certain words feel in my mouth and that's how I chose the character's name. So the next question comes from someone who did not, did not attend today. But mm -hmm. Um, the character Oscar in your short story, Birds, seems to be <laughs> written, seems to be written to incite only resentment in the reader. Uh, did you feel any sense of pity or understanding with Oscar and similar characters while writing? Yeah, I wrote that story so long ago. I think I wrote that story in 2004. And, um, I just wanted to write a character who was kind of a snake. And it's kind of funny because I think the story has actually played out in TikTok recently with the whole modern warrior drama. One of my friends said, didn't you write this short story? I was like, I did, and now it came true. I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, but I think it's also important as a creator, you don't always want to write likable characters because we don't always interact with likable people. And just getting into that character. Like, Oscar's a terrible person. He's a terrible person in that short story. Um, and I was curious to just see what it would look like to create him on the page. And But it was so long ago. I think I wrote that story 18 years ago. Yeah, I think I wrote that story in 2004. Wow! <laughs> so it's been a really... I don't think I could write that story now, nor would I write that story now. That's another thing, as an artist, you have this timeline of work, you know, I wouldn't make the same choices now, but I still honor the person I was who made those choices. Um, you already touched on this a little bit, but I was wondering, what about supernatural powers inspires you in your writing, and if you could have a supernatural power, what would it be? Ooh, I mean, oh, I just like the idea of superpowers, right? <laughs> you know, and I write, all of my fiction, and my short fiction in particular, is about women coming into sort of ancestral powers or being part of these lineages. Um, there's a woman in I Succubus who uses her gift to destroy um, sexual predators. There is another story called Blood where a young woman receives her gift uh, of empathy and healing when she has her menarche for first period. So I just like this idea of all of us carrying these secret powers that are born in us, that, that are in us, and we just have to awaken them. 
if I had a superpower, it would probably be healing. You know, um, I don't like to see people in pain. I don't like to see people suffering. Right now, my dad's sick with ALS, so he has a terminal diagnosis. And I know if I had any gift in the world, it would be to heal him. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And that's all the questions we have prepared. Does anyone have any other ones that they like to ask? Um, I was wondering where you got the character of Ovis and his father and where that kind of stems from. Because they're like the main male mm -hmm. figures in the novel. I wanted to have these noble ish warriors, you know, and I like them enough, you know. Um, I, Ovis is necessary for the plot, like you need Ovis right. for the book to move forward. Um, so I think Ovis was just kind of like, oh, I'm going to create this noble warrior with this healing ability. Um, and I have a lot of people who are like, what's happening to Ovis? Like, what's going to happen in book two? And I've, I've made a creative choice so far that people aren't happy with, but I told them. <laughs> but I might have to change it. Um, but I just wanted to create the kind of lineage of men who do respect women and their gifts and the matriarchy. Because I think that so much of patriarchy really is um, part of colonization. You know, that, that that sort of like men having power over women has come through like this hetero patriarchy. And that a lot of indigenous cultures were matriarchal, were matrilineal and that men defer to women and their choices um, and people who birth, not just women, people who birth because gender is also very fluid um, in pre-conquest cultures. So I just wanted to create these dudes who respected women. <laughs> thank you, Ms. You're Rachel. welcome. Thank um, you for these great questions. Yeah, and thank you to the Festival of Books and to my county public library for setting this up. Um, you had a great time. Yeah, it was good. Awesome. So thank, well, you. thank you so much for your thoughtful questions. I really appreciate them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I was going to ask like an off question. Yeah. But do you have like a specific playlist for like when you write? I do, and it's chaos. It's a chaos <laughs> playlist. Um, it's so funny because it's a mix of everything from, I listen to a lot of Bad Bunny these days. Um, so there's a lot of Bad Bunny, there's orchestral music. I have been obsessed with the same band since I was 15 called Dead Can Dance. There's mm. a lot of Dead Can Dance, you know Dead Can Dance. Uh, I'm so sad they canceled the concert because of pandemic. Three times now they just canceled the tour and I'm heartbroken. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of Dead Can Dance on that playlist. I have a Spotify playlist that I think Fierce Reed is going to put out. Oh, oh nice, yes. Um, and there was just a mix of it. It was an interesting part of my writing process. Before I became an author full time, I worked as a wrought iron painter. So I was working construction sites and things like that. And I didn't realize until pandemic hit that my writing process is really tied to me moving my body. And I would sit and still this and wonder why can't I create? Then I realized I need to move my body. So I bought a mini trampoline and I set it up in front of my writing chair and I would just bounce on my trampoline before I wrote to really loud music and then be able to write. Which is weird, but it worked for me. So yeah, that was a fun playlist. I have everything on it from like Erica Badu, Bad Bunny, Dead to Dance, Todd Rundgren, like. <laughs> Just, it's a mix. I have a really eclectic music taste. What's your next project? It is a follow up to The Lost Streamer. <laughs> well, India and Saya have to figure out their relationship. You know, there's a lot of trauma. They both have experienced a lot of trauma. And trying to learn how to love with trauma is really hard and they're coming from two very different experiences and um, they're trying to learn how to love each other through their pain and through their confusion while at the same time being on a quest to try to save their world so I think it's a really complicated it's been a really complicated and hard love story and just trying to figure out there's different types of love stories and 
a lot of love stories are very complicated and every time we love somebody we're bringing in everything we've lived and all of our experiences and so you have India and Saya with really complicated pain and sadness and grief but really wanting to love each other really wanting to trust that connection but I don't they don't really know how me too <laughs> You just have to get out. You just have to like try to backtrack. You have to. There's a lot of cutting that goes into it. You know, there's a lot of. You write something you really love, but it takes you to a dead end street, and you have to just back up and say, "I'm sorry, I love you, but you're gone." Mm-hmm. Which is hard, and I've given myself the gift of learning how to mourn what I've written and then move on from it. But and nothing's wasted. None of that's ever wasted. I have a folder where I take things I cut and I put them there. Um, one of my favorite scenes that I ever wrote was this beautiful market scene that takes place in Alfonso. It's out of the book. It doesn't exist. Um, and I love that scene. It's such. It's probably one of my the most beautiful things I've ever written in my life. But it just didn't make sense for the story. Um, there were characters I had to cut and get rid of. But I, characters. There was a grandmother character in the city of Alfonso, and I had to get rid of her. And she was wonderful. But then sometimes I'll take something like, um, I was putting Dua's backstory in the book, and it didn't really fit, but I liked it so much that I wrote a short story about her origin story that I have just sitting on my computer. And that's just for me right now. Maybe I'll share it with the world one day, but right now it's just for me. And you have to have a lot of grace as an author. You have to give yourself a lot of grace just like in life. And be like, well, that didn't work out. What's next? So you said 10 years in the making. On and off. And then you wanted a trilogy, but now... It's a duology. Yeah, it's a duology. Which I'm really grateful for. Now that I'm like, do you do book two? I'm like, woo, there's no book three. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm pretty grateful. But I think from what I've seen from some of the readers who have interacted with me, they want me to stay in this world. They like this world. They haven't seen this world before, and they want me to stay in this world. So I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about there. I have another novel that's in this world, but several hundred years in the future, or probably maybe a couple thousand years in the future. But I have, um, and that's been fun to play with. I actually, one of my um, writing practices is to always have uh, a cheater project. That when I'm tired of working on this book that I'm working on, I will take a break for a couple of hours and work on another project that is just for me, and then I can come back to what I'm currently working on refresh. Yeah, I really enjoy, like, the way you describe the set, especially. It's so cool. To, like, I almost want to see it, like, as a movie. Cause me it's just too. So cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I really l- enjoyed writing the dream. Yeah. You know, I have a really... Uh, long-standing deep meditation practice and I think when you have a really long deep meditation practice you can sometimes almost enter other dimensions of color and light and sound mm-hmm. so that's where the dream came from um, it's just that there's just deep subconscious imagining and also another thing I do I always meditate before I write and I would talk to my story and I would talk to my characters and I would say what do you want you know, I'm here for you. What do you want? I trust the story that is coming through. You tell me what you want, and I'll do it. And that's how... Because sometimes something would show up and be like, I don't know what's happening, I don't know what's going on, but then it would work out. Yeah. Um, where do you draw your inspiration for, like... Sorry, like, oh, yeah, it's fine. Um, where do you draw your inspiration from, like, the spirits in the dream? Because we see a lot of, like, different ones with names, some are unnamed. Like, where do you get that? Just imagination. Like, what kind of funky characters would I want to create? I love the little frog spirits yeah. so much. Like, those, I actually thought about getting those tattooed on me, but I was like, no, the twin serpents have to be <laughs> the tattoo. Uh, and the second book has, it really centers the twin serpents. So, I just had fun when we just imagine characters in the dream, and yeah, I just had fun with them. I think the dream scenes are probably some of my favorite to write. 
And well, one of my sisters was like, you need more dream in the next book. I was like, okay, director, sure. If that's what you want, that's what you get. And I, I let her name um, one of the characters in the next book. Because she was so excited about the book that I was like, you want to name somebody? <laughs> and she thought about it for two days and it gave me a whole like list of reasons why she chose the name. It was very sweet. Yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> You mentioned you started dreaming in the in the same spot uh, 25 years ago. Um, before that, did you do you remember dreaming, or was it just like not always in the same? I mean, I think I recall starting to go to this dream world in my teens, like probably my mid-teens, and then I just keep visiting it over and over and over again. I also have a practice where I write down my dreams every morning. Mm -hmm. I keep my dream journal in bed with me, right next to me. And as soon as I wake up every morning, even if it's fragments, I write down my dreams. Um, but I go to the cove a lot. I recently went back to this weird parking lot that I hadn't been to in a while. There's like, he, there's a, um, the healing temple that is in the city of Alcantara. I go to kind of a version of that with like hot water pools that I just soak in in my dream world, which is really cool. Um, I just must have a very interesting subconscious, <laughs> you know? Um, but one of my sisters goes to the same world every night when she dreams, and then one of her children goes to the same world every night when she dreams. Yeah, we have our own like weird little lineage, and it's been fun. It's, I've had a lot of fun doing this. Uh, I think that's the thing. Like, a lot of writers take themselves very and I take myself seriously. I take my work seriously, and I also allow myself a lot of play, because I think play is just as sacred as work. And just as necessary to the human experience. Yeah. I try to play a lot. Like, that's the trampoline and the karaoke mic. And <laughs> I've also befriended all my neighborhood animals. I started feeding the crows during the pandemic and now they bring me gifts. Oh, I, I am that crazy crow lady. <laughs> they bring me marbles, little it's so cool. It's like the coolest <laughs> thing in the world. Um, yeah, but it's been a lot of fun. You, you got a little Dr. Doolittle in you. Well, my yeah. sister is my sister is like, you're not Snow White, you're Snow Brown. <laughs> <laughs> like, I am Snow Brown. <laughs> uh, I don't think my neighbor, my next door neighbor, hates crows, and I'm like, too bad, <laughs> too bad. They're my friends now. <laughs> and then I have the best. I I every time I look at my book cover, I can't believe it. It's so pretty. <laughs> Just the richness of the color. He really, the artist Samuel Rodriguez is brilliant. Um, if you follow, if you're on any social media, definitely look him up because I couldn't have imagined a better cover for the book. I had a different vision in my head, and then when they showed me this, I was like, oh yeah, that's it. That's what I want. <laughs>